Welcome to Talking Shop, a podcast by New Syndicalist, a resource for trade union activists and organisers. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Brexit and I'm joined by Lydia and Chris and myself Andy uh, making my debut on Talking Shop. So yeah, if we could just go around and introduce ourselves and maybe talk about the uh, last album we've been listening to. Uh, hi, my name is Chris. Welcome to Talking Shop for those people who didn't switch off as soon as they heard Brexit. To the few that are remaining, I will explain why we have inflicted this upon you. The last album that I listened to was a release that came out a couple of days ago. So we're kind of mid-August at the moment. And it's a album by two UK bands called Pine and Conjurer. And they embarked on this project. They're kind of mates as, as bands. And there's a festival in Bristol that is brilliant called arc tangent which is actually happening as as we're recording this episode and i'm very sad that i'm not there because the lineup looks absolutely amazing this year but they were going to get together and do this performance at arc tangent and they ended up having so much fun they recorded this album which has the brilliant title of curse these metal hands which is also <laughs> the name of super hans's band from peep show <laughs> and it is it is joyous metal it's i i don't know how else to describe it but it's it's strangely positive and energetic and it has some really interesting ambient and soundscape quality so i definitely check that out if you're interested in that kind of thing i'm not as cutting edge I feel like I don't listen to any new music ever. Like, there was a time where I'd be like, I knew what was being released. I knew about bands that young people liked. No. <laughs> I, just, I have no fucking clue. Um, I, I went through a phase like that as well, I have to say, and then I discovered Bandcamp when I stopped going to DIY spaces and it was like being a virtual DIY snob. So I'm yeah. really into that now. Maybe that's what I need to do. I yeah I feel a bit sad that I've kind of uh, lost my way but so I've been listening to an album from 1998 <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but and also maybe this is a quite a depressing way to start the podcast um, so I've been listening to um, American Water by Silver Jews um, because well a it's like one of my all-time favorite albums but b um, Dave Berman who was the um, the singer um, and songwriter for Silver Jews um, died like a week ago I think on the well 10 days ago now like on the 7th of August and it was like one of those things that always felt I think he was like 52 or something and it always felt inevitable that it would like his uh, time would be up uh, too soon but um, yeah American Water is like is their best album they're a band so he's a poet like just an absolutely incredible poet. And he started the band with Stephen Malkmus from Pavement. So they've got like an amazing pavementy feel to them, but like with Dave Berman's lyrics, which are just the world's best lyrics ever, and his like amazing baritone voice. So I would I would definitely recommend listening to Silver Jews in general, but specifically the album is perfect. Yeah, maybe a good time to revisit it. Mm, yeah. Andy Andy, what's the album you've been listening to i've been listening to a band called uh, carissa's weird which are again a late 90s uh, sad <laughs> band so there's a definite uh, definite divide <laughs> they are like a really cool seattle i think like yeah late 90s like chamber pop sad indie kind of thing nice. yeah one of the the album that i liked was songs about leaving which kind of gives an implicate impression of what the uh, what the band's like but i would check them out they're on spotify and um yeah good stuff great well you may be wondering why we have selected to do a brexit episode and i have to say that for some time it was something that i personally was very reluctant to go into and i think in and and really we haven't actually published any material or done much analysis on Brexit. Now, part of that is is the view that we do have an international audience of the podcast and many of the ideas that we discuss go well beyond the British context. So we were a little bit wary of just talking about an issue that very much 
affects Britain. However, I think it's fair to say that in the ed- editorial team, we have been guilty of a wider trend within the left of basically burying our heads in the sand and hoping that this nightmare that is Brexit just kind of goes away. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a wake me up when it's over. And unfortunately, it, it's taken some time, but I, the reason I proposed that we look at this in Talk and Shop was I think that this is going to be the defining issue for the next generation and maybe generations to come, that Brexit is not going away. And it's perhaps a lesson for all organisers and activists that we never really fight on the terrain of our choosing. I think if we're waiting for the perfect issue to mobilise around, we'll be waiting a very, very long time. Mm. Brexit is going to be shaping the lives of our members, of working people in this country. And it is going to, as hopefully we go into in, into this episode, it's going to shape the trade union movement and the prospect for union organising. Preparing for this episode, I think, revealed that actually the relationship of Britain to the EU and the issues that are raised by Brexit actually tells us a lot about the strengths and weaknesses of tra- trade unions within a global capitalist marketplace. And actually... If we're really going to take on seriously the idea that unions can be transformative vehicles, that they can change the lives of people for the better, then we also need to accept that the environment in which we're doing that is one in which there are forces operating on a on an international, on a global level that, that we need to face up to. So hopefully that is a convincing enough rationale for you as to why we should be looking at this issue. We, we've broken it down into a number of questions that we're all going to be introducing and dealing with separately. One of the central things that we wanted to tackle as an editorial collective is actually from the perspective of a union organiser, from the perspective of the workplace, what does Brexit mean and what does the EU mean? And actually there's been a lot of commentary going on in Britain about you know, what Brexit means for Parliament, what it means for democracy, what it means for political process, what it means for borders and migration. There hasn't been a lot of discussion about what it actually means from you know for trade unions and for union organizers so hopefully we can address that deficit maybe as a as a useful introduction to this issue i thought it was useful to outline what the history of the eu was to trade unions and and what this organization intends to establish as a framework for trade union organizing now it's important to say for the upset that the european union is not a fixed entity and it never really has been and is probably best understood as an evolving set of institutions that change according to the demands that are made for them by various competing interests that have a stake in a European Union project. Nonetheless, for the history of the European Union, we see that there is a consistent commitment to the idea of a European free market global economic competitiveness versus other trading blocks around the world and probably most important for us an ent- an entrepreneurial and adaptable european labor market now people who have been in trade unions for a while and do a lot of union organizing tend to know what those terms mean when when the boss comes to the the workplace or comes to the staff meeting and says you need to be flexible you need to be adaptable We tend to know what those actually mean. It means cuts, it means poor labour conditions, it means undermining rights. There has always been this notion of a social Europe, the idea that the European project has a loosely defined set of commitments to equality, social justice, and other broadly social democratic values. And that has been there from the beginning, but actually this has largely been secondary to this idea of creating a cohesive European market. Now, concrete improvements in work and workers' rights via EU legislation have occurred within the UK, but they're more a by- by- byproduct of the desire to eliminate competitiveness between either state. A really strong concrete example of this is within the Treaty of Rome, 1956. Maybe you should also clarify that many of the settlements and institutions of the European Union arise through various treaties that are negotiated with the member states. So the Treaty of Rome was a very important one in 1956 and there was this commitment to gender equality that was very progressive for the time. But actually the driving political force behind that was French concerns that an underpaid German female workforce was going to undermine 
the industries that were in France at that time. So, yeah, the byproduct is now that gender equality commitments are within the structures of the EU. But actually, what was motivating that was the idea of a level playing field um, for capitalists. Now, it's also worth noting that, like I said, there were these benefits from EU labour law, but actually British workers only really benefit from them in the context of really poor working conditions comparatively across Europe. In the wake of historic defeats from the British trade unions, spearheaded headed by the Conservative government in the 1980s, and the failure of the British trade union movement to really offer anything meaningful to resist that since then, really what we have in this country are the barest legal minimums that are pretty poor compared to most European states. Workers in France, Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands and Scandinavia, for them, EU employment law actually has no relevance. And that's because their their local national labour law is so much stronger and beneficial that they wouldn't have any reason to use EU directives to defend themselves. Now, trade unions are accepted as relevant institutions for consultation within an EU lobby circuit. And there is an organisation called the ETUC, European Trade Union Contra Congress, that has had some success in influencing policymakers at the European level. However, this is in this weird hybrid NGO, non-governmental organisation, charity status that they operate with. So they're kind of seen as a stakeholder citizen organisation rather than actually being a an institution with power that negotiates for its members. Uh, and actually, on a European-wide level, any EU law on wages, strikes, and, and kind of specifically uh, labour conditions related to pay is prohibited by the Maastricht Treaty. So there is a concrete legal limit to that lobbying, and there couldn't be, for example, a European-wide living wage uh, as something that could be raised as demand or internationally guaranteed protections for collective bargaining rights, which also may be hugely beneficial to European workers. EU directives likewise show that preference for consultation and stakeholderness at a local level as well. The, the European Union has set up this institution called Works Councils within its framework of EU labour law. Now, Works Councils, again, they're organisations that allow companies that has ba have bases and and outlets in various European states to consult with trade unions in a central place. However, in the words of the directive, these works councils have no power to delay or veto management decisions. In fact, many companies use work councils as a way to refuse union recognition because they say, well, you already have a voice, you already have a say, so therefore we don't need to go negotiate with you for a trade union structure. More specifically, uh, of, of most immediate re relevance in terms of how the EU has negatively impacted labour rights is the case of the crisis in Greece and how the European Central Bank, the European Commission and the IMF colluded together to severely undermine labour conditions in Greece as, in their role as a creditor to bailing out the Greek state. Here we saw the elimination of collective bargaining rights, massive reduction in legal minimum wage ra rates and a sweeping program of austerity that drove huge numbers of the Greek population into extreme poverty. So what, what's the kind of general picture of what's happening in terms of the EU and its relationship to trade unions? Well, it's been relatively good for the UK workers, but actually for most European workers, it's of very little relevance. Ultimately, the market rules supreme and is the defining factor in anything that the EU does in terms of trade union and labour laws. Trade unions have a say, but not really a substantive one and not one in which they're in a position to bargain on behalf of their members. So I, hopefully that gives you kind of a, a general picture of where we're at uh, pre-Brexit, <laughs> before the fun happens. And he's now going to talk about before Brexit, what those advantages of being in the EU actually may mean in terms of labour law and and how people operate in a workplace on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. So I think uh, Chris did a really good outline there of what, um, what EU labour law has done for uh, British workers and the, um, yeah, the important thing that he's mentioned about it, EU labour law looking good for British workers because our general working conditions are 
comparatively poor is um, an important thing to remember. Currently, all EU labour law still applies to the UK and will do if and when we leave the EU, whatever whatever date that is. Uh, so in theory, during any transition, new changes to EU labour law will be put to Parliament for them to vote on. Uh, this is assuming we have some kind of deal with the EU when we leave. So this is um, something to remember because I think there's quite a lot of like hysterics about leaving mm. the EU, specifically from FBP Twitter <laughs> people. <laughs> um, so it is, a, it is not a doom and gloom situation um, entirely. Um, but obviously, whether those changes get agreed um, is kind of fairly dependent on how worker friendly future governments are and how strong trade unions are in resisting any negative changes or pushing for them. As Chris pointed out, EU labour law is meant to provide a baseline um, and that the EU isn't necessarily the worker friendly organisation that Remain liberals and socialists paint it as, uh, or at least as a more contradictory beast than that. There's also various bits of UK law which didn't come from the EU, so our minimum wage, rules on the deduction of pay, etc. And some aspects of the U UK employment law are actually better for workers than the EU basics. Whenever we talk about labour law, I think it's really important to draw the distinction between workers' rights and trade union rights. So both the EU and the UK government have been more in favour of uh, increasing workers' rights, albeit relatively slowly and not quite what we'd want to see, whilst restricting trade union rights. So this is more in the UK, but some European Court, judge, court of Justice rulings recently have been relatively anti-trade union. So some advantages of current EU labour law that we... Um, we see in our workplaces that we take on a day-to-day -day basis stuff like paid annual holidays improved health and safety protection rights to unpaid parental leave time off for family reasons and equal treatment for part-time fixed term and agency workers rights for outsourced workers and for trade union representatives to receive information in restructuring of companies so some of these laws particularly the ones around agency workers probably wouldn't have been implemented in the absence of the eu largely because the government at the time in the uk was not in favor of their implementation so i think it's really in areas like this where the government isn't interested and unions find it hard to organize so agency workers is a particularly good example of this or unions choose not to organise in it, potentially is a better way of saying it. It's areas like this that EU labour law has its advantage. The European Court of Justice that I mentioned earlier has also tended to give more worker-friendly rulings than domestic courts, although, as mentioned previously, not necessarily the case in trade unions, specifically where a trade union is organising across borders. So companies that have sites in two different co countries. Mm. So that's like a, a very short overview of what EU labour law does for the UK worker, effectively. Mm. So I don't know if people want to talk more about that and their thoughts. Yeah, I think it's important to note that stuff like the Working Time Directive, that the UK government negotiated some flexibility on that, which doesn't exist in other European states. So mm. again, it's one of these crazy things that European based workers look at us and go, why would you make, why would you want to make someone work more than that? Is it what the upper limit is? I'm trying to remember. 48, it, 48, 48 hours. hours yeah. I was going to say 40, but yeah, it's worse than that. 48. <laughs> but what on earth would you want to make someone work more than 48 hours a week? Clearly, they will not do a good job if they're working that length of time without any any breaks or or any days off. But you know, the context of our labour market and the and the way things are in the UK means that that flexibility was negotiated by the UK government, and I think that's probably an important point to make that even within this context of basically the British government kind of being pushed in in a di direction where it doesn't want to go in terms of labour law, actually it pushes back in other ways. Yeah. Mm. The other thing that uh, certainly coming from my own experience is ultimately, I mean, it's a broad and general point, but I think it's it's worth making 
label law is only good as people's access and knowledge of it yeah. and i've been in a lot of workplaces organized in a lot of campaigns where people's understanding of what their rights are is is minimum and that's not their fault we're not educated yeah. on these things and yeah. in many ways it's the trade union's job to educate people on these things so a lot of the time you'll find that a struggle arises over the realization that a protection exists and actually mm -hmm. people aren't accessing it i mean yeah with the it's like anecdotal but that working time directive all of my contracts that i've ever signed have immediately opted me out of it which i'm sure i'm sure is the case for a lot of workers here it's um it's like a bit of a truism but between equal rights like force depart force uh, decides right and obviously that's very much the case in a place where you don't have a organized workforce the other thing that i wanted to talk about which is probably going to be a running theme throughout all of the issues that we're talking about is just the general fecklessness of British trade unions <laughs> <laughs> that actually you know how have we got to a situation mm. in which the barest minimum is that it's not just like oh that's great it's like that's yeah. an argument for staying in the yeah. absolute barest minimum it's yeah. so terrible that we are, we are arguing for things that people in in other European states wouldn't even consider to be good good yeah. rights to having a workplace yeah the bar is so low isn't it it's a bit of a sorry state of affairs and it's interesting that the people that because I don't even feel like it's necessarily the unions that that have really been banging this like but we need the EU rights drum it's like this is the second time they're being mentioned but FBPE Twitter like many of whom will have had like zero to do with uh organizing ever this is their their big thing it's like the most that they could ever imagine that anyone everyone anyone could ever expect to have at work it's really odd like the horizon is um so foreshortened at this point maybe that's useful then to move on and talk about actually what the limitations of these pieces mm. of legislation are if you want to lead off on that lydia so i think it's been mentioned but um so eu labor law basically has been designed to level the playing field for businesses in EU member states. So for instance, companies in EU countries couldn't cut their labour bills and reduce prices by like refusing to offer paid annual leave. So obviously workers benefit from things like paid annual leave, but they weren't the regulations weren't brought in to like rebalance power at work. Like they are byproduct of um of an attempt to make sure that the countries in this block can't kind of undercut each other. Which is obviously not a good basis for uh, for us to be like generating rights and like definitely not a basis to build any power from like in the context of a right wing a, a right wing uk government like this one and you know in the past and decades of attacks on trade union rights that's you know the protections offered by the eu do look pretty good like i think there's lots of reasons for that but i do think i do think our particularly miserable context doesn't help so it's interesting to think about how things could look different maybe with a left-wing Labour government in power. I'm being Dave here somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Someone has to talk about the Labour Party and somehow that person is me. <laughs> Not a Labour member. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Well, we could have we could have Corbyn in number 10 in a, in a few weeks, right? Not if the Lib Dems sort, the, sort themselves out. <laughs> It's him or Ken Clark. <laughs> How absurd is that, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the or somehow, for some reason, Yvette Cooper. I mean, who knows? Did you see um, the um, the guy that wanted John Major? <laughs> oh, <amazing. laughs> like, yeah, it was mad. I think it was Andrew Adonis wanted John Major in power or something. Like, it was <laughs> someone who was an MP was saying, like, oh, we should have a like a yeah never mind it was it was wild that's, that's amazing i love it maybe one of us could be the prime minister well, when you said john major i was it, it's funny because i had in my mind when they read ken clark and yvette cooper it was like these are the greyest and blandest people that they could think of <laughs> yeah, and then and like, no yeah. we can go for king gray <laughs> <laughs> we I can love go grayer. yeah Ken Clark just like came back from two weeks holiday and said, I'd be willing to be prime minister. 
He's like, I've not really been following the news, but I would be willing to do it. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. <laughs> Taking one for the team. What What I'd love is like my, I mean, not it's not a positive scenario, but it would just be <laughs> beautiful if somehow uh, Labour gets the Lib Dems to back down, Corbyn mm. gets into number 10 uh, under this caretaker government, and then basically reveals it's been a, a deep, deep, deep entryist Trotskyist tactic. Uh, his plan all along was to basically stage a coup <laughs> and the, all of it brexit the referendum everything it was all like all all of the scandals it was all it was all a, a carefully orchestrated plan yeah Seamus Milne behind it all yeah. he's, he's cooked it all up oh I guess um taking on Dave's mantle of talking about the Labour Party it's it is interesting to look at like what if what impact being remaining in the EU would have on some of the things that Labour want to do. So a key part of Labour's current industrial strategy, their policies, is a change to the way in which public procurement is handled. I'm sorry, that's so boring. Public procurement. <laughs> like even just like saying it makes me want to go to sleep. But you know, in the context of Brexit, it is interesting. So that's the it's the process by which providers are chosen to provide public services, for instance, like in the NHS. So the, a Labour government would, so they propose that a Labour government would make things like trade union recognition and like checks on wage disparity, disparities mandatory for people that are bidding to run services. It's a bit like, there's a, a lot of back and forth on this, but it, it can it can be argued that that wouldn't be possible if the UK remains in the single market. So either by remaining in the EU or by negotiating a deal in which we we remain part of the single market. The EU directives that govern procurement uh, prioritise competition. So uh, the lowest bid couldn't be disregarded on the basis that it didn't adhere to stipulations about workers' rights. If um, I could interrupt mm, a second. Yeah, yeah. That mechanism is a free market mechanism isn't it public yeah. procurement is the idea that uh, you know how you how you decide who is going to who you're going to outsource your services yeah, to absolutely. is based on bidding and the, the cheapest offer yeah so uh, it's interesting to me that the labor solution obviously i'm not completely up to speed on all aspects of labor policy but maybe you could help me out here <laughs> seems to be that we'll take this free market mechanism yeah. and just kind of make it a bit nicer yeah, totally. It's yeah, yeah, it, it is really interesting, especially in the context of like, I'm not totally sure like where it fits in with things like renationalisation and because they do like trying to get rid of like uh, private um, providers in the NHS, like, I'm not sure whether this comes first, and then they work on that stuff later. But yeah, this is like relatively minor reform in a bad system. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of public institutions that are forced to kind of operate as free market businesses yeah. anyway within i'm thinking of schools here for example mm -hmm. academy trusts are, you know aren't strictly speaking businesses but they're kind of almost forced to operate as businesses yeah. there's a particular bugbear of mine is one of one of the aspects of public procurement that interferes with with me is if i'm organizing a trip at school and mm -hmm. it, it falls above a certain a cost then it needs to be bidded out to basically the lowest bidder, regardless of whether the experience I think is valuable or useful or worthwhile, which is that's, just really annoying. <laughs> yeah, that's that's mad. In my school, for example, the graduation trip that we run for year eight, which costs a lot of money because mm. the entirety of year eight are involved, so there's a lot of money <laughs> involved in this project has the location and the provider has changed every single year which is not a sensible way of running an no. excursion for young people no. and for getting staff to get on board and be oh yeah no I did that last year yeah I know what's yeah, going to yeah. go on but it changes every year because every year there's a new bloody bid <laughs> Christ do you just say you want a trip to, to like roughly be about this or like have these outcomes and then there are and then you have to look around for who'll who'll kind of provide that cheapest basically yeah if it falls falls above uh, a certain yeah. cost yeah and and there's lots of expectations of this kind of thing of many public mm -hmm. institutions schools hospitals all sorts yeah 
Yeah, and I mean, this these sort of tweaks to it obviously don't really kind of get to the core of what's what the problem with that is. So the e, I mean, the EU talks about social value. They call it social value as part of decision making processes when it comes to things like public procurement, but that's subordinated to a very narrow definition of value for money and the rights of profit making entities to kind of set their own standards. You know, we know this like the EU is a neoliberal project. It doesn't really have any interest in workers' rights for their own sake. Like, you know, only as they kind of might uh, benefit. You know, the the project like as a as an economic block and we, we've talked about this but I mean Remain campaigners point to EU labour law as a key reason for wanting to maintain our membership I think it speaks to a deep pessimism or sadly some disinterest about the potential for workplace struggle to provide wins that actually generate power unions are brought in as consultants by the EU they don't exercise any real power and this is I think how a lot of people particularly the kind of sort of liberals and centrists who talk up the EU as a force for good think unions should work like just sitting around a table with employers and economists sort of yeah in this consultative role they don't really think about these things as as being about power but just like advice giving and that filters you know from the top down to you know what what like ideas of what trade unions are or they're just there to remind you of your workplace rights so I mean I think the problem is that it relies on rights being granted from above you know by an institution which doesn't really care about (laughs) about workers rights and that we could win more with you know democratic member-led unions and we can do that inside the EU like workers all over Europe have that you know and like Chris was saying have won you know much better rights than the EU grants I mean, I think it's important as ever to distinguish between rights at work, which, you know, the EU has given us a few basic rights at work and power at work. And obviously we can use rights to increase or wield power at work. It's more difficult to win when we have fewer rights. But the ones that we currently have by virtue of our membership of the EU are the sort of bare, absolute bare minimum that we should expect. And that should be, you know, only the sort of the basis on which we fight for more, not kind of what we sit back and accept I think that's a really important distinction to make. Uh, One thing that came to mind, Andy mentioned that the consultation on restructuring Mm. is an aspect of EU labour law that has gone into British labour law. Now, I've I've represented, I've I've represented members on a restructuring process. It's quite common within Mm. schools, especially under the context of cost cutting and that school budgets getting smaller and smaller. Often mm. they'll, they'll restructure and they'll get rid of support staff, get rid of admin staff, collapse departments, all sorts. And I would say in my experience of, of many schools, the majority of schools, is they follow that consultation process well. Mm. That where they recognise trade unions and they're prepared to work with them, they, rec- they, they will recognise the rights of trade unions to give them information about what they feel about the consultation. Now, does that translate into power? No, absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. Because actually what the consultation process becomes is you say, these are all the things that are wrong with the way that you're doing this. All the standard arguments, less staff means less quality of service. Uh, it's going to affect the students, it's going to affect the way the school operates. You know, you, this could it'd be any any workplace. You know, it's going to affect it negatively in many ways. Mm-hmm. They then go through their consultation, come to the end and go, Right, well, we've listened to you, but we're just going to do it anyway because all we need to do is listen to you. That's what that's what the consultation process says. Yeah. What's the reality of the trade union response then? Well, actually, most of the time it's, it's strike action. It's the old-fashioned way of organising that relies on very different metrics of whether you have power, which is, you know, how strong is your base? How strong is your membership? Are people agitated and willing to move around this issue? Mm. so and that's power at work isn't it and yeah, really exactly that legal context it gives us maybe one step in the right yeah. direction but it doesn't give us much yeah exactly yeah I mean I think um I think the example Chris gave in the introduction mm. of Greece and the troika is I think like a really important example contemporary example of the like limitations of uk of eu labor law or eu the eu in general when you have like a positive socialist project in one country 
Yeah, I mean, like the example Lydia gave of not being able to do public procurement in the it's like one small example of that, but it did effectively like bring a whole country to its knees and make it change yeah. its its government in a uh, or like make it change how its government worked, and then in a pretty um, <laughs> a pretty shocking and pretty horrible way. Yeah. And I, yeah, I do think like fairly basic social democratic stuff that Corbyn wants to do. I mean, there is again, there's a potential that the EU will be fairly ambivalent or quite negative towards that. So it's quite a. Um, I think that is b- worth bearing in mind when we talk about the limitations of the EU. But that's again like a broader scope than the like specific trade union stuff that we're talking about here. Yeah. Because, I mean, it does cause problems for all sorts of bits of, like, of, for instance, the Labour Party's industrial strategy. Like, the public procurement thing's interesting (laughs) insofar as it could ever be interesting. (laughs) It's like, you know, specifically talking about about workers' rights within within that context. But things like renationalisation and stuff, all of that stuff is um, potentially problematic in the context of of the EU and and, uh, labour law in the EU. I mean, a lot of commentators make this sort of realist argument that basically, if you're powerful enough, you can kind of throw your weight around. And Mm -hmm. actually, there's lots of member states who bend the rules and violate EU. Well, I mean, particularly in Eastern Europe, there is a number of member states who violate some of the very, very basic principles of democracy free association Mm -hmm. that that the eu is founded on and they are given a hard time but actually because they have support they they're not really disciplined to the same extent but one thing that could be raised is i I think and this this is maybe something that's problematic with the leave and the lexit argument which i know we're going to talk about in more detail Mm -hmm. later actually markets and 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 capitalist big capitalist powers discipline governments when they do this kind of stuff anyway yes yeah yeah and whether it's the if it's not the eu it's going to be international finance it's going to be the us it's yeah. possibly even going to be china i mean there was i remember uh, it was a long time ago but in the lead up to the greek crisis there was actually an incident in which the uh, dock workers of Greece went on strike and actually a great great deal of commerce goes through Greece because because of its mm. its location on the Mediterranean and basically China threw like a massive wobbly and started throwing its weight around politically and saying this is not acceptable you're holding up the export of our goods so just because just because the EU is potentially you know formally removed as a mechanism of of disciplining governments it doesn't mean that that's not going to happen in within the context of the world that we we live in yeah maybe we should talk to we've kind of moved on to the area of brexit so maybe it's worth mm. dealing with that head on so one of the things that we wanted to think about is if and i think that it is an if at this point if brexit was to happen then how might this transform the state's relationship to trade unions Obviously, within the EU, the trade unions have a certain place. They have certain protections. We were thinking here both about the change of legal framework, but actually the impact of Brexit. How would that change the trade unions? If it's going to be a no-deal Brexit, which which looks more likely than it did a year ago, then actually how would, how would the economic fallout change the way that the trade unions would be forced to operate? Now, obviously, this is all speculation, so it's hard to make any concrete predictions about what is going to happen. There's many variables here, and actually, you know, it, it's unclear at this point whether Brexit is going to happen full stop or what what Brexit it will be. Mm. However, there are some factors which I think are worth thinking about. So the first is that where we are now in terms of the weight and and power of trade unions in the uk there's been a slow and steady downward decline in the number of days lost to industrial action since the 1990s and rather depressingly 2018 recorded the six lowest annual working days lost to labor disputes since records began in 1891 right. and 
I found that pretty shocking considering yeah. that that time scale actually includes World War One and World War Two. Yeah. <laughs> where labor disputes in certain industries were prohibited and also just generally very, very heavily regulated. Mm. So that shows how bad things have gotten in a way, or at least trade unions are not really, uh, the mainstream trade union movement is not using strike action to form, to afford its agenda. We could, if you're thinking about a hard Brexit and the economic fallout from that, look at how the 2008 market crash and the financial crisis was dealt with and whether this had an impact on trade union activity. And actually, again, depressingly, strike days continued to decline following 2008. And heavy legislation against trade unions like the Trade Union Act of 2016, which puts really strict expectations on turnout for balloting for trade unions, means that they're even more reluctant to be militant in their posture. Uh, you know, I can tell you that a lot of trade union officials are worried about committing themselves formally to strike action only to find that a turnout means it's not going to happen. They're worried that, well, I mean, publicly, that looks really bad. It's a demoralizing process. It means you're going forward and going through all of the legal loopholes that you'd have to go through to run a strike ballot in the first place only to not have your members turn out mm. to the to the level that you need for for a strike action to take place. So a lot of them are terrified about that. So the assumption that economic shocks can motivate trade unions into action, unfortunately, hasn't really been borne through by our recent experience. And actually, probably what's happened post 1980s and what within the trade union movement is called the new realism is probably a better guide. So the new realism was this idea that actually things were getting tough. The state was attacking the trade union movement. It was better to be pragmatic and just to try and negotiate what you could within that context. And rather ironically, parallels could probably be also drawn with the way that the UK joined the EU because many trade unions were actually anti-EU at the, at the time of the uh, EU's, sorry, at the time Britain first joined, campaigned strongly on an anti-EU uh, stance. And then when it was clear that it was inevitable that Britain was going to join, modified their position, and now they're all remain. So it's, it, it, mm. basically the British trade union movement, at least in recent years, has been incredibly defensive, tended to be just adapting to situations rather than challenging them. However, there are some counterpoints that we consider. Some industries, a no-deal Brexit particularly, might have a potentially catastrophic impact on their members to the point that we're talking about collapsing of industries, particularly in heavy industries and agriculture. So this may force the trade unions into action. The other thing is actually trade unions aren't just their leadership, they're their members as well. Mm -hmm. And a membership who is seeing an incredibly damaging economic deal or a no deal may be implemented by an unelected Conservative Prime Minister. Who knows what's going to happen, but that could be a feasible scenario. Mm. It's, it's not going to take that laying down. So one of the concerns, actually, of the Trade Union Act was heavily legislating against trade union ballots would prompt more wildcat strike action, people just walking out when they had enough. And that that's still a possibility that people you could see more informal strike action in France, for example, in response to austerity and the closure of a lot of factories and workplaces was a huge wave of occupations that could that could be replicated here. Finally, some commentators, not very good commentators, have made parallels between Johnson and Trump and speculated that maybe some kind of protective deal could be made that maybe Johnson will reach out to workers in the way that Trump supposedly reached out to coal miners. But actually, you know, we can evaluate what Trump did quite effectively now because he's been in office for some time. And in spite of on the campaign trail saying, you know, Trump digs coal coming behind, you know, coal miners, actually, 
he hasn't really done much to co- to protect the coal mining industry in America. That mining job losses have continued to be very high. The government hasn't agreed hasn't guaranteed sorry pensions in collapsing parts of the industry and not addressed really serious ongoing safety concerns such as silica regulation which would curb black lung amongst american coal miners plus johnson himself has never really indicated that he's going to protect british industry in any way he does a lot of kind of posturing about elites and the establishment which is laughable considering where he came from and who he stands for but Really, everything suggests that he's he's going to pursue like a very harsh free market vision yeah. of what Britain's going to be like. So, yeah, I think that's that's quite a pessimistic outlook. <laughs> but I suppose I'm pessimistic for the institutions that have operated mm-hmm. to defend workers in the past. And actually, I'm not I'm not pessimistic about how people will respond to a very harsh brexit scenario yeah i think that's how i feel too when i was sort of doing the reading and and, um making some notes for the episode i was just like i did feel quite bleak but yeah i think it's um i feel similarly like i feel like i don't have faith in the institutions i mean whatever my uh however much i talk about public procurement you know i am still an anarchist But yeah, I do. I mean, I do think there is potential. I do think that the idea that workers like basically locked out of taking like legal strike action, they've got to do something like with how they feel about it. Like they're not just going to be like, oh well, <laughs> we can't do anything. I think if things are bad enough, that would be really interesting. I think we would see people walking out. Yeah. So I'm similarly pessimistic, but optimistic as ever about people's capacity to get pissed off and fight back so this is definitely more of a depressing 90s uh, music than joyous <laughs> 2000 joyous <now>. metal <laughs> i want to say that i'm a little bit skeptical the wildcat strike thing like i can see i can see potential where i think when we've talked about having the lowest level of strike ever like people need to experience going on strike in order to do it without a ballot i think yeah. like if like it seems a um, it seems a pretty bold claim to say that a workforce will go from you know having never struck in like recent times to going on wildcat strikes with you know lack of support from their trade union effectively and I think as well the the comment that Chris made about them these wildcat strikes being localized is that that is you know, I can only speak from my own experience, but when we were doing the Deliveroo strikes earlier this year, which um, I wrote about and you can read on on New Syndicalist. Nice plug. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice plug. Well done, Andy. The, well done on the article or well done on the strike. But um, the, <laughs> the fact that they were localised is kind of part of the problem, right? Like, mm. you do need these strikes to be wide-reaching or general yeah. rather than localized and i think as well you can see like the the cwu the post office union does have a history of going on like localized wildcat strikes in its industries in well in the post office sorry and this hasn't really delayed didn't really prevent the privatization of the royal mail it hasn't so i'm i'm a little bit skeptical there of that mm. that particular claim yeah that's fair i think the rest of it i do I do largely agree with and yeah share your both of your depressed criticisms of the <laughs> the institutions of the British state and you also don't see any light at the end of the tunnel <laughs> um, it's a, a nationalized train coming towards us yeah I mean it's it's there's no easy answers right I think that's part of that's always been a, a consistent comment at New Syndicalist. Yeah. That we've we've said, you know, member-led democratic militant unions do win things, but they need to be built. They need to be, be yeah. rejuvenated within the trade union movement, and we can't we can't simultaneously criticise the trade union movement, which we do consistently, and then suddenly expect them to do the right thing. Yeah when difficult situation comes wrong. I think you're right, Andy, that that 
it's difficult to stage wildcat action without strike experience. I think that's probably represented by the history that the most or the strongest examples of informal or wildcat action probably in the 1970s in the Britain where there was actually really strong formal action at the same time. Yeah. And you saw people using wildcat strikes and occupations to go further than the trade unions were prepared to at the time. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think the, the point about national coordination is really important. I think thinking about this, I was thinking a lot about how social movements and activists tried to resist austerity and how there were lots of really inventive and creative responses to the cuts that the government, the British government was introducing in response to the financial crisis. But there was a lack of national coordination and really power building. There was a lack of power building. There was yeah. movement building but not power building, which was mm. probably made worse by various silly aspects of like left factionalism and, you know, all the fun silly bollocks that various <laughs> Trotsky's, Trotsky's sex get up to. <laughs> as well as anarchist ones, to be fair. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We are not above this. Maybe, maybe it's useful, Andy, to talk about the more positive vision that certain people have of brexit in the form of lexit not i think maybe not a majority position but certainly one that's out there yeah so i i should say that i'm i wouldn't necessarily call myself a lexiteer uh partly because it's a horrendous word but uh, <laughs> also because i think it's a bit of a a bit of a silly philosophy but i'm going to i'm going to um outline a few things that i like potentials in terms of Lexit uh, or left Brexit. So yeah, in theory, uh, a left Brexit or more specifically a left government coming to power post Brexit, which I think is more likely than a left government redefining the terms of Brexit now, would have the ability to play a more interventionist and protectionist role in the economy. So whether this is nationalising key industries, uh, rail, water, steel, Weather spoons, or pursuing a, <laughs> pursuing a more protectionist trade policy on a global level. But this is obviously dependent on a number of aspects, right? So the main one being that this left Labour government can come into power and that it has a sufficient mandate to carry this out uh, whilst avoiding capital flight, backbench rebellions, etc., etc., might be worth so, defining what you mean by capital flight, Andy. Sure, yeah. So capital flight is a term, an economic term, which I think a lot of uh, people have heard of probably the like outcome of this rather than the, the actual term itself. So capital flight is the idea that businesses will move uh, their money, their investments, et cetera, or jobs, et cetera, outside of a country which is trying to adopt what they per- perceive as anti-business policies. I think it's a best like a decent working example of it definition of it yeah 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 um, people often look at france in the 19 yeah 19 Mitterrand government in france yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah well that happened in effect yeah and i think it's also worth pointing out that it's far easier to do to um enact capital flight now than it was in the 80s so yeah uh so like i've said i'm skeptical of this and i think it's probably more likely that there'll be an election after we've left the EU than before it. Although I wrote this before all of the recent like Lib Dem Labour shenanigans have gone on. So <laughs> who knows? It's hard to produce relevant commentary anymore, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Things yeah, are changing so fast. It is everything. Yeah. But yeah, I think, I think it's likely that there'll be an election after we've left the EU still than, than before we've left it, either without a deal or with one. I think regardless, if a left Labour government does take power, it'll be left with two different kinds of hands, bad situations to deal with. So either a Tory deal, which doesn't have the interest of the working class, working people at its heart, or it'll be negotiating from a position of weakness for a trade deal with the EU. Because I think it is it is important to point out that no deal isn't a permanent thing, right? Like eventually we will need a trade deal with the biggest and closest trading partner to us. So at some point we will have to have a trade deal and some some kind of deal with the EU. What do you mean, Andy? We're going to get all our food from New Zealand. <laughs> New Zealand. That makes sense. Mm. Trump, 
Trump uh, chlorinated chickens in New Zealand. Chlorinated chickens. Yeah, New, <laughs> New Zealand lamb. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're vegan, Chris. So you're. Uh, Spicy. <laughs> It was Your nice days numbered. I'm going to rely on the indigenous vegetables of Britain, which I think is kale and leek and swede. <laughs> it's going to be, be brilliant. Podcast. <laughs> Dealing with either of those, I think, will take up a substantial amount of time for any government, which limits what it can do on the domestic stage. And I think we've seen this like over the last, what, two to three years anyway. Like most of mm. Theresa May's government has been spent was spent trying to sort out a deal with the EU and like the real pressing issues that face this country haven't really been dealt well the real pressing like domestic issues that face this country like housing etc haven't really been looked at since then but yeah so one of the advocates one of the reasons that left Brexiteers advocate for leaving the leaving the EU is um the idea that we can you know, nationalised key industries, like I mentioned. But I think it is worth reflecting on the past history of that and their relation to workers and trade unions. So we touched on this a bit in the co-ops episode, I think. And yeah, there has been a history of workers campaigning for and organising for workers' control in state-run industries and firms. So there is still like conflict between worker and an employer if that's state-run or if that's, if it's private-run. A lot of the, in the initial nationalisations that happened in a lot of key industries, it was often the prior owners of those industries who ended up sitting on, for example, the National Coal Board. Yeah. So in in reality, actually, the, the, the people were the same as well yeah. in terms of the employer and the conflict. I mean, so one of the arguments is obviously that a public run industry will tend to have better working conditions than a private one, or at least this used to be the case, as I'm sure Chris can attest to. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm a little bit sceptical of this again, given the current state of public services. You know, trade unions are struggling to oppose the academisation of schools and the privatisation and outsourcing the NHS, although there are some local fightbacks against this. And I do think it seems wildly optimistic that a Labour government would be powerful enough not just to improve the current public services that people are used to but to expand a program of nationalising other industries that don't have like the direct and emotional impact on people's day-to-day lives that health and education do. Mm. And rail Uh, maybe. Yeah yeah Yeah. I think rail has more of like a frustrating uh, (laughs) than a uh, the emotional frustration. Yeah there's a difference between having to pay like 10 quid to get into town and seeing your child get a shit education, right? But there's two are different things. At a broader level, I think Lexit could have offered the chance for the left to use some of the rhetoric around Brexit, so that of taking back control or of self-determination, etc., to argue for a society where working class interests are put first in our workplaces and in our communities. This never really like materialised during the Brexit campaign the referendum campaign i think probably in a large part due to the balance of forces you know like the leave campaign was dominated by the right and the remain campaign was dominated by the centrist to liberal left but i also think probably people are more used to imagining control and self-determination on the level of nation state rather than workplace and community yeah so that's critique of Lexit, i think rather than a uh <laughs> and advocating for it as such but I'm I'm interested to hear what what people think of that. If it happens, we'll just I don't know. We'll, we'll apologise, right? We'll say. I mean, we'll be moderately happier. Won't yeah. we? They're Lexit yeah. Britain. So. I'm I'm always glad to be wrong of my scepticism. <laughs> like yeah. nearly, nearly always, I think. Do you do you not feel that Lexit has kind of been constructed after the fact that this is people desperately trying to make. A positive I, vision out of something that is yeah, fundamentally I, I, driven by right wing and sort of right wing populist think, forces. I think that, and I think like retrospectively, like grouping together a series of like, so like you mentioned, this is like left skepticism of the EU has existed for like quite a long time. Like the, I think like the official Communist Party and like the like Benite left have had this like critique of. Mm the EU and I think partly this has just been like a name that's been applied to 
quite a small existing phenom phenomenon with the left in general. But yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally those, the people advocating Lexit don't really have the power to implement it and didn't really campaign that much for it in a successful way, I think. Mm. It's fair to say. Yeah, I mean, I think I saw more of this stuff. Maybe it's just pe looking in different places, but I think I saw more of this stuff in the lead up to the referendum than I do now. Yeah. Um, like, I think people, I think there are things that people thought were possible or had hopes were possible, which, you know, three years later <laughs> don't feel possible anymore. I mean, the big thing that people kept saying was, um, they were talking about fortress Europe and talking about, you know, migrants dying on the beaches, like in Europe, um, you know, and about, about, you know, well, you know, we need to leave and not be part of it. It's like, <laughs> I mean, that was, that seems like the main Lexit argument that I was hearing. I mean, it's like the most emotive one, right? But yeah. I mean, that was always kind of nonsensical because it's like, well, we have a Tory government. Like, I don't see that we're going to be anything other than like fortress Britain after this, you know, it's just kind of. I mean, it's, um, it's also, sit like to be incredibly blunt but syrian refugees will continue to die on the beaches of greece regardless of whether the uk is in the yeah. european union or yeah not. exactly it, it it doesn't i mean it's not like we could wash our hands of it and it's not like it would stop so it never felt like a real argument to me and i definitely see less of that argument but also just less of this of the kind of lexa arguments you just talked about andy i think people feel like more pessimistic maybe I mean, we haven't talked directly about migration issues. I know we're getting on to them, mm. but it's a really important point to make. And actually, the Labour government has historically, obviously, it has different leadership now, and it, it's not the same people we're talking about. But historically, the Labour Party has had a very, very poor record yeah. on migration, treatment of asylum seekers, treatment of refugees, and border control. Yeah. And I don't find it reassuring that a Labour-controlled British government would take a radically different stance that would no. be adequate to address the movements of people in, in the not. wake of you know climate crisis, war and all these things that motivate people to leave. No, I mean, you know, bigger budgets for border guards and stuff is like they are they current Labour policies. Yeah, absolutely. The, the sort of the flip side of like left potential for sort of post Brexit Britain is the uh, like truly terrifying <laughs> right right wing visions for uh, post Brexit uh, UK the post Brexit UK economy. So there are sort of two main ways in which um, the right have proposed remaking the UK's economy in the wake of a hard Brexit or a no deal Brexit. So the first one is the idea that we could adopt a kind of Singapore style model. So it's Jeremy Hunt is kind of one of the kind of main proponents of this. So Singapore is tra totally transformed since it became independent in 1965. So it went from having a GDP per capita of $512 to being the eighth largest GDP per capita in the world, bigger than ours. So Tory MPs sort of point to the ultra low corporate tax rate, deregula deregulation of the financial industry, cheap labour as something that we could replicate here to hang on to banks and entice businesses away from the comparatively regulation heavy EU. That would be a nightmare, obviously, for ordinary people. It would mean kind of bonfire of labour rights and slashing of public services to pay for a corporate tax cut. But I think there are a number of reasons that it just kind of wouldn't really be possible to implement a Singapore style model here. There are massive differences in the role of government and spending between Singapore and the UK. So Singapore basically spends nothing on public services. It spends just under 18% of GDP. In contrast, even now, the UK spends about 38%. We'd have to get rid of state pensions and the NHS to, to like even think of getting our spending down to anything like that level and I don't think even the most like rabidly free market Tories think they could get away with doing that but in a funny way low spending doesn't mean that the Singaporean government is low interventionist they own most of the land and they directly house about 80 percent of the permanent population it's also like extremely authoritarian and um, it maintains this kind of 
long-term technocratic rule by criminalising opposition. The economy relies on steady supply of migrant labour. It's about 25% of the population at any given time. That migrant population, particularly those who are older or unskilled, are poorly paid and precarious. And there aren't any independent trade unions to help them fight back. Given like that's, I mean, the migrant situation is like a real key to sort of why Singapore has done what it has with its GDP. And given that reducing immigration was a key plank of the Leave campaign, there's kind of no way Brexiters could suggest increasing the amount of migrant labour into the UK. And without that, there is no Singapore model. Like you just you just can't do it. The thing that's more worrying are the Britannia Unchained crew. So this is basically like the worst... Such a good title. I, yeah. I've made them sound too cool, I think. They're not a crew. They're just they're all just awful. As a historian, I, I was I was immediately when I saw that title, I was like, Britannia yeah. and Chains. That's that's a bad look. Why would you yeah. allude to I was like slave trade and imperialism yeah. and yeah, yeah, all these it, bad things. Don't associate chain with Britons if you want if Britain if you want to make <laughs> To make it look good this is this is the type of person we're dealing with here they are monsters so they're like the worst people in the conservative government they wrote that wrote this like almost comically mean book called britannia unchained so it was the free enterprise group that wrote it dominic rab is the most public face of the free enterprise group it also includes luminaries like pretty patel and liz truss so monsters all basically she's the one who talks about cheese isn't she yeah loves cheese <laughs> loves cheese with trust my dad was completely obsessed with that speech that she gave about cheese he kept asking me if i'd seen it and it was just i mean it was great i understood really his obsession with it we're going to post a link we'll post a link for people who haven't seen it it's it's glorious she's very angry about, <laughs> about people not eating british cheese it's amazing <laughs> It's, yeah, who knew anyone could get so wound up about cheese? But the key argument of this awful book is that the UK's workforce is too lazy, is lazy and too secure, and that leads to uh, low productivity. So when he was talking about the book prior to its launch, Dominic Rabb said, people are coasting. It should be easier to let them go, to give the unemployed a chance. It's a delicate balancing act, but it should be decided in favour of the latter. Huh? He's just an awful person, isn't he? I was just responding he's to dis- that. Yeah, he's despicable. He's just a um, leech. I think he worked in like corporate law before he was an MP, which, you know, there you go. <laughs> Problem solved. He does sound like a lot of HR managers I've dealt with. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, he's like the world's worst HR manager. They're all anti-immigration and they've basically realised that you don't need to exploit migrant labour when you can decimate labour law and the welfare state alongside making massive tax cuts and, and and deregulating everything. So the book was written in 2010, um, but Brexit could provide an opportunity to implement these policies, which might otherwise have proved too toxic for the electorate. They're kind of disaster capitalism 101. They're all, they're no deal enthusiasts. They don't think we'll be fine if we crash out of the EU. They're like banking on us very much not being fine to soften the ground for the most sort of right-wing neoliberal policies since Thatcher. I think this is actually much more likely than Lexit, <laughs> um, than any kind of like left-wing opportunity. I think it's extremely worrying that the Labour movement is in such a weak position at exactly the time where it's likely that it will be under the most severe attack in recent years. I th- certainly from a no deal, if a no deal was to go through, I think... I can see those kind of ideas being put forward yeah. as as realistic in heavy quotation marks exactly. at that point. Yeah. I mean, it, it follows from, it's Naomi Klein, isn't it, who writes about the shock doctrine, yeah, about exactly. how they, you know, actually neoliberal ideas on a common sense basis are generally quite unpopular. Mm. But if you create a state of crisis and you, you argue that these things become unnecessary, then people start to accept them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they've been wanting this for like the last 10 years, but they, you know, they haven't been able to get anywhere with it. You know, I mean, obviously the, the Tory government have done like loads of awful things, but but yeah, they're, 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 they would exploit the chaos of, of a no deal Brexit to to force this stuff through yeah under the guise of it being like a realistic practical way of dealing with the challenges of 
of a post, you know, of a no deal Brexit. Yeah. And it's just a race to the bottom kind of philosophy, isn't it, basically? Yeah. That's why they're going home about no deal. They don't think it will be fine. They know it won't be fine. (laughs) I mean, I think uh, the the other thing I want to pick up on, which is important to talk about, is GDP. Yeah. So GDP is a measure that's often referred to in mainstream economic commentary, and GDP is used as this metric measurement of how countries are doing and how wealthy they are. Mm. But actually, number one, it's a very poor measurement of actually what is going on in terms of the productivity and the industry of that country. It doesn't take any account for the gross social inequalities that may exist within that society. So it could be that GDP is very high and inflated by, you know, the vast amounts of wealth that are concentrated in a minority and doesn't account for the huge numbers of people that may be living living in extreme poverty. That's certainly true of Singapore. Like the gap between the richest and poorest in Singapore is absolutely vast. Yeah. And I think we need to overcome this valuation of of how we see countries and nations. I mean, you know, this shouldn't be... It should be not really an argument that we need to have with our listeners, but yeah. in general, like the, these are the kind of things that if we're going to push forward a transformative vision of how we think society should change, we need to reject outright the idea that these measurements are useful. The, I'm going to go to not Marx now. Fucking hell. <laughs> but I'm going to talk about Nietzsche. Which is maybe a little bit controversial. Hashtag not a fascist. He wasn't an anti-Semite. He had awful views on women, though. Really, really awful views on women, which I do not stand by at all. Awful views. But he did talk about the idea that society needs a transvaluation of values. By by that he means you just you don't just look at how society operates, but you look at the morality that underpins it. Yeah. And when in a capitalist society, the morality is you know, the things that people think are good are profit. And GDP is a perfect example of how something is brought in as a, as a measurement of what is good and what is bad, but really no one really challenges the underlying assumptions, yeah. which is that a country is good when money is being made, not a country is good when the people live there happily and freely, they live enjoyable lives, they have leisure time, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I think that that needs to be challenged and it will be more robustly challenged because we are getting into that. When we talk, when we engage with this idea of Brexit, you suddenly, like you have, find yourself talking about public procurement and yeah, yeah. economic policy. So it, we should we should challenge more thoroughly the values that underpin some of these things. Yeah, absolutely. Talking about value, is it good to talk about how Brexit is dividing people in terms of their values? If you'd gone talking about value and then pivoted into your Marx lecture, that would have been that would have been such a segue. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think we should we should talk about that. Yeah. See, Andy, there's linen. <laughs> and in the linen, <laughs> there's linen and there's coats. And go on. <laughs> Skip to the end. A lot of people in the mainstream media, particularly, have been arguing that Brexit represents some kind of new left-right divide. And one of the things we thought it was useful to talk about as we enter into the last section of the podcast is actually on the ground for our organizing. Is this a value that we need to take account of? Do we need to think about how people think about Brexit when we are trying to organize campaigns on the ground and we're trying to mobilize people into action? Now, my view is that Brexit doesn't really represent a newly created divide, but actually has highlighted some existing problems that have always been there within the traditional constituencies of trade unions and left-wing parties like Labour, that actually there has been some quite good research on this issue. And a survey in January 2019 found that although Leave voters did share some common demographic, demographic indicators, they tend to be ethnically white, older, tended to have less access to the internet, which was actually quite, I found that quite interesting given the kind of remainers going berserk about paid social media ads and facebook yeah. that actually leave voters tend to have poor access to the internet and, and tend to rely more on traditional media for their news 
and have lower educational attainment in general. Ultimately, <clears throat> though, they tend to be conservative voters were leave and Labour voters were more likely to be remain. Now, why does that create a problem for progressive left movement? Well, actually, because in a workplace, you will always have a mixture of those two people. You have people who have progressive social values and people who have traditional traditional conservative values. Where the, where the problem has often arisen is that trade unions and labor, the Labour Party has often tried to solve this problem by rather than trying to transform the values of those people, basically just offer an economic message. So to uni unify people around the idea that their wage needs to be improved or there's an issue with a certain aspect of workplace regulation. In some ways, Labour has gone in the opposite direction in this and has, has pandered to very negative and authoritarian views when it has been in power. So if we think about new Labour's war and asylum seekers, the policies that they were putting forward on crime and antisocial behaviour, all very kind of negative and regressive. There's always been this mixture of kind of authoritarian and socially progressive views within working class communities. That's always been the case. Occasionally, the left has tried to paper over this by with, a, with an economic offer. Sometimes it's to tried to pander to right wing views while also maintaining some elements of a liberal progressive idea. Brexit is now a wedge issue, which more clearly divides people. It's almost like Brexit, whether you leave or remain, outs you as fitting into one of those camps. Uh, are you social authoritarian, broadly speaking, or are you kind of liberal and more progressive in your social views? Now, I don't think that really is a new problem for trade union organisers because actually one of the fundamental kind of one-on-one -on -one issues that we often address is how do you deal with prejudicial attitudes as barriers and obstacles to a campaign? We would argue that inclusiveness and migrant solidarity is essential to building resilient and successful union campaigns and that we need to think in a more transformative way about working class culture and, and how that can support union power. So I don't think Brexit is a new divide, but what it does is it puts into sharp contrast divisions that are already there and it makes it difficult sometimes to unite people. But maybe that's a good thing. Maybe actually we do need to address more head on some of the problematic, challenging, regressive attitudes that exist within trade union branches that maybe need to be challenged. Yeah. I don't know how people feel about that. Have you, have you in your organising or campaigning, found a mixture of these views like people who voted voted leave and voted remain or have you are you have you found kind of overwhelmingly you're dealing with one type of person I mean I think if I were in if I were a dual carder I mean I'm in the IWW I think if I were also in a mainstream trade union it might have come up more obviously the IWW is for better or for worse uh, quite a very politicized union it has come up not around the issue of Brexit but we've talked about this briefly before where in London, some of the couriers, some of the delivery or Uber Eats riders, lots of them are Brazilian and a number of them are like vocal Bolsonaro supporters. Like uh, they have like stickers on their mopeds and stuff. And the decision was like just to kind of not really engage with that, but just kind of, you know, demonstrate through like solidarity and like practical help <laughs> what the alternative is mm. um, so you know show like showing rather than like giving them a lecture about it um, yeah I think that's constructive and helpful I'd, I'd say there's definitely discussions to be had about the way that these ideas are challenged for sure mm -hmm. yeah I mean certainly in my in the area that I work I, I would actually say that it, there's a higher variety of, of leave and remain so I, I work in Nottinghamshire and the Bassett Law area specifically, and that was a leave voting area. And I often you know, find it quite surprising that some of the people that I interact with who are incredibly strong advocates of trade unionism will also be leave voters. Yeah. And now I think part of that is that the motivations for voting leave were very complex and don't map very easily onto anything really. Mm hmm but I would, I would definitely say, not necessarily the same people, but I would definitely say there are some quite conservative attitudes within that area, which is always consistently voted Labour, Labour at general yeah. elections. Yeah. 
Andy, what have you found? It have you found that you deal with a mixture of people, or largely people who vote leave or remain? Or um, I mean, my so my organising has been similar to Lydia's, and that has been couriers who, by and large, it, well, the issue of Brexit didn't really come up, but most of them were non-European migrants. I've done yeah some casework and some organising with, but again, it's been predominantly with younger workers and with European migrant workers. So. I mean, the issue of Brexit didn't really come up there, probably because most of them remain, but also because they had more pressing things to mind than uh, the geopolitics of the British state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think actually that's a really important point to make as yeah. well. That, yeah, yeah I, I should I should maybe clarify that if you bring it up, yeah. this can be a divisive issue. But actually, day to day, people are not talking about this really yeah. in terms of workplace issues i think like what you what you mentioned in terms of like the myriad of causes for voting leave i think the you know some of the causes of that like the sp- specifically places like maybe not nottinghamshire but like south yorkshire and places like that where you've seen like decades of underinvestment deindustrialization increasingly poor working conditions and poor futures where like, a generation ago it was considerably better stuff like that is stuff that needs to be organized against otherwise it gets derailed and gets distracted into this weird narrative of like like polish migrants are the yeah um, this like european super state of the problem <laughs> um and i think that's kind of yeah part of the issue isn't it and that's mm-hmm. really what the organizing on the ground's about uh, not so much brexit and the like machinations of the tory government Mm. as much so let's move on to that question then should should trade unions therefore take a stance on brexit is it a useful thing to do is it a relevant thing to do i think it is worth highlighting the problems that brexit poses to unions um that as chris alluded to and as we've talked about earlier in this thing so unions as institutions or bureaucracies will have conflict and interests and it's important to understand that so centre, centre left unionists have tried to centre, I've said centre so many times, um, have tried, <laughs> to, uh, tried to bring economic issues to the fore rather than concerns about migration. And that can work sometimes, but when it's so clearly a divisive issue, like 50% of the country is one way, 50% of the country is another way, I think that strategy can struggle a little, like on like a larger scale. I think in individual workplace campaigning, where you're seeing like oh we might lose our jobs or this or that it's less of an issue obviously like paid staff of a union rely on the dues of its membership the uh, the fees of its membership they may not want to take too divisive position if they think that this might affect how their members or potential members feel and they do also the vast majority of unions in this country have a like a social democratic vision where they're reliant on redistributing profits from businesses and those businesses investing in continuing in Britain in order for their members to keep their jobs. So this would probably mean that unions are more likely to support Remain, which is what we see the vast majority of unions kind of effectively taking that stance, although with some some moderation, some uh, like additions. So the largest unions in this country, so Unite, Unison, GMB, effectively have the same position as Labour's. They want Labour to be the ones negotiating any deal with the EU and they support a vote on any deal reached with the EU, regardless of who's made it. A a second vote, sorry, on anything. This was from a decision taken a month ago. Obviously, like things do change fairly rapidly in Brexit, as as we've seen over the last week. But this is still the case, still the position for most unions. I think there is a little bit of a risk in this strategy so i think unions are then seen as these unions will be seen as complicit in what at face value does appear to be pretty undemocratic so regardless of the arguments for a second referendum and i think there are some legitimate ones Mm. on the face of it it does look like a bureaucratic maneuver to get a a second answer because you don't like the first one that is how it looks effectively i think for a lot of people yeah but even with this in mind the most of the people arguing for a second referendum, you know, are kind of hoping that it gives the answer of Remain. And I don't think the people campaigning for Remain have really come to terms with why people voted Leave, like I mentioned earlier. 
Yeah. And the polling suggests that the polling suggests people are still pretty evenly split on this issue. So it's the polls are still roughly about where they were in the days and weeks before the election. So it's I think it's a bit of a risky move that they'll be effectively like advocating for what looks to be the leaving side or p- yeah. could potentially be the leaving the losing side, not the leaving side, sorry. So some Brexit supporting unions um, do exist. So the RMT, ASLEF, which are both um, predominantly railway workers unions, um, and the Bakers Union have all come out with a support in general of leaving the EU or respecting the result of the original referendum. So for the RMT and ASLEF, they've got a position of bringing railways back into public ownership, which is made more difficult by the EU, although not impossible. And then the Bakers Union issued a statement last month that we've effectively saying that we've had a vote and that we should have a general election because there's more pressing issues facing the country. So stuff that we've mentioned earlier, but poverty pay, housing crisis, schools and education. Interestingly, they left out the radical demands for nationalising Weatherspoons and Greggs. But you can't, obviously, you can't put everything in your press statement. (laughs) Regardless of that um, cowardice on that exec's part, I do have some sympathy with the position. As I mentioned earlier, like domestic issues seem to have taken a massive backseat over the last few years and they do need to be dealt with. Like, I can only speak personally, but the membership of the European Union compared to having affordable housing, jobs with good working conditions strong unions and good public services those things are far more important to me than our membership of the eu and i think that's the case for like so many people in this Mm. country and i would take that over the status quo and remaining in the eu although sadly that's not what's on offer out of the smaller unions that we tend to focus on a lot uh so the kind of like london cleaners unions and the iww kind of more nationally only the IWGBs really come out in favour of remaining in the EU. I don't know if this has been like officially, but in terms of attending and organising presences on like anti-Brexit marches, the IWW had a stance around the time of the referendum of like, we support migrants, we're ambivalent on the EU. And the UVW and the Cleaners and Allied Industries Workers Union, Kaiwu, uh, haven't really made much noise or made a, had a position on it in some way. As we mentioned earlier, we view unions as like vehicles to transform society. So we probably should expect them to have something to say about it. And the working class, which makes up unions and the labour movement, has historically been at the forefront for demands for democracy and democratic reform in this country and around the world. You know, in terms of taking a position on Brexit, I would say that unions should research how Brexit will affect their members' jobs, communities and their industries and then directly ask their members that unions of that union what their position should be on Brexit and then respect the result of that. I don't, I think so many, there's different industries which have conflicting priorities. So like we've seen, RMT and ASLEF have different, predict, uh, different priorities to ones like Unite and Unison. Mm. So your, your solution, Andy, is to have many, 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 many more referendums. Let a thousand referendums, believe yeah. <laughs> I don't think we're quite divided enough as a nation. Let's have more 15% split. (laughs) I mean, let's say uh, it is a bit of a cowardly thing, admittedly, to say that as a syndicalist, I think unions should be should respect reflect the views of their members. I think is a bit of a cowardly uh, get out. No, I think, yeah, I, I wonder if the framing is unhelpful though because i i absolutely agree with you that unions we we do you for unions as vehicles for transforming society not not every trade unionist does but we do and therefore we should expect them to have comment on social issues but i do wonder if buying into this your leave or your remain is helpful whether it's better that we have things to say about the eu like like we've done here we have things to say about being outside the eu like we've done here but then we have a message that goes beyond just picking option a and option b i do agree with you but i think that we have kind of seen the there is some well for example like labor has had a kind of more nuanced position on brexit than other 
political parties in the past and that did have like problems with in the like media and in the commentary like commentary mm. and in polling like people didn't really understand their position and like it does it is a shame but things these things do boil down to um a binary or like soundbite issue yeah. and i think i obviously i do agree with you and it's kind of what we've said throughout this podcast that the issues facing the trade union movement are like almost independent of membership of the eu right like mm. and the solutions to them are almost independent of membership of the eu but that's not often an answer that people want to hear yeah yeah i think that's right yeah i think ultimately people do want to hear i just i suppose my concern but maybe this is just coming to terms with the reality of where we're at a lot of people just want to hear well do you agree with me or not well yeah <laughs> <laughs> and there's there's limitations to kind of how transformative we can be if we're just saying we're going to go with one side and not the other yeah. but uh, yeah i it's a it's a really tricky issue to engage with and I think like I said at the beginning that's why there's been that reluctance on the part of many people within the left to actually actively engage with it because it is mm -hmm. difficult to I suppose we're talking about the fine balance between not 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 just not kind of limiting what you can do so you want to just be like well we don't just want to leave and remain and that's it we want to go much further but actually communicating what you want to stand for in a clear way that speaks to what's going on but actually is able to go beyond it yeah and that's maybe a tricky formula to put yeah. together the one thing we haven't talked about in great detail though it, we did touch on the issue in terms of the career organizing you were talking about mm -hmm. i think that's really an important point that actually there's a huge amount of non-eu migrants yeah who work in this country who are organizing who are organizing successfully but obviously brexit is going to have an effect on not just non-eu labor but also eu labor as well it's going to change the context of mm -hmm. the, yeah. of the border and yeah. how migrant labor is treated so i think it's worth turning to that issue more directly yeah like there are obviously lots of reasons behind the the leave vote but i think one thing that's like relatively consistent is that you know, major motivation was anti-migrant and racist sentiment. Like how people get to that position is complicated, but ultimately that was where people got to. And I think that was a kind of, that was a major, a major reason for that people voted to leave. And I think, you know, it's a funny one because it isn't actually white middle-class EU migrants that leave voters wanted to have like removed from the country they're just the ones that they could vote to you know in a roundabout way kind of remove so i think it's likely that the current uptick of racist rhetoric and and violence um against migrants and, and people of color uh will continue i don't i can actually just don't think brexit will ever be over um, yeah I, mean, however I agree we, with you there yeah i just think it's going to go on and on like i think however we leave it doesn't solve any of the divisions that led us to the referendum being thought uh, necessary you know I think the right will be galvanized by a narrative of betrayal if we leave with anything other than no deal and then I think if no deal happens we can expect this kind of like disaster capitalism um you know ex like neoliberalism on steroids so you know either way things are going to be bad like you have a vote you know in large part motivated by racism leading to like a real galvanized right so i think in light of this our priority has to be uh defending migrants and convincing the whole union movement to do the same i think some of the mainstream unions have had next to nothing to say about migrant rights as workers or just you know in general you know at, at a time when migrant rights and trade union rights and you know obviously where those t two things cross over those rights are likely to be under attack hopefully the movement will finally realize that there's nothing to lose and, you know, everything to gain from taking a strong position on, on this. You know, we don't need to pander to people in the labour movement who are racist or have other socially conservative attitudes. I kind of feel like these days more and more that people will be convinced by like, effective organising or they won't be convinced at all. Like they're not going to be convinced by you yelling at them in a branch meeting or... <laughs> 
yeah, and I don't, I'm not sure that's where our time is best spent. Yeah, I agree. So thinking about what that organising would look like, I mean, it starts where migrants are. It starts in the industries where migrants work. Um, it would follow on from what unions like IWW, UVW, IWGB have been doing with cleaners, careers, drivers and factory workers. But these unions are really small and it's time for members of large unions who pay their dues but don't get involved in union democracy to start getting involved, start pushing their branches to prioritise practical migrant solidarity and to prioritise organising <laughs> in general. Just doing some organising. Just, That'd be great. Do, just yeah. try, have a go. <laughs> And I think it might also be necessary to, for unions and their members to think about whether or not they're willing to or able to break current trade union laws to go on strike in solidarity with other workers or in protest against attacks on migrants or on our current like meagre rights as workers. I think it's also important for us to remember that, you know, our fellow workers have struggles that fall outside the scope of traditional trade union remits. And we need to create a culture in our union branches that enables people to feel comfortable to tell us that they're going to be evicted or that bailiffs are harassing them. We need to make sure that migrants in our branches know their rights in case of a raid at work or if they're refused health care or, you know, confronted with like with uh, charges for health care for themselves or their families. All of that is true of unions all the time. But if we enter the Dominic Rab nightmare scenario, then I think this becomes more important than ever really absolutely what's interesting about the context or interesting and depressing about the context that we've entered in is that freedom of movement has just absolutely disappeared from the political conversation yeah and i think the reason that that's happened is because the political parties have accepted that this is something that cannot be argued on the freedom of movement or the ending of freedom of movement was a major motivating factor for the leave vote yeah and therefore while you may be able to bring leave voters around on other issues you cannot bring them around on freedom of movement yeah. and as much as we talked about the fact that the eu is constructed as a trade block that prioritizes the cohesiveness of the market and neoliberal free market mm -hmm. capitalist values actually freedom of movement should be seen as, as as a worker's right yeah should be seen as a worker's protection and it should be argued as a worker's protection and that has not been happening yeah no absolutely no yeah i mean it just it feels like it's an argument that's completely lost it's one of the major um splits in the labor party about labor party policy on brexit you know there was a campaign for freedom of movement from some of the Labour left but it's you know it's not even something that the whole Labour left can coalesce around yeah. like the, you know the wing of the Labour Party that you would think well not think hope would be able to come out come out strongly you know in support of freedom of movement they can't they can't even do that. The areas of reassurance are perhaps looking at what has been going on in the US in terms of community-led organizing mm. to protect migrants in response yeah. to some of the stuff that Trump is doing. It would be wonderful and fantastic to see that happening here, people taking mm -hmm. a real active role in protecting yeah. people in their communities. I mean, and I think you've already seen, like, I mean, borders encroach into more and more public spaces as well. Like, they're in, they, they increasingly encroach in schools and in healthcare and I think also you know supporting say doctors who refuse to or who try and avoid uh, charging patients for for healthcare or you know teachers that refuse to fill in you know or refuse to comply with like census stuff you know this this stuff is stuff that unions should be doing. I think to be fair NEU and UCU I believe have taken stances on these yeah. things yeah, yeah yeah but it's that difference isn't it of like NU, formerly nut had a very vocal and critical stance on prevent for example yeah and said prevent legislation was had racist motivations behind it was mm -hmm. used to target people of color and in practice was targeting people of color and minorities a ucu took a very strong stance against the border agencies 
going into universities attendance data and using that to monitor yeah. people on students student visas but we need to i agree with you need to go beyond public stances there needs to be yeah. organizing and campaigning to protect yeah people people need to know that if they do that the union will back will back them up that's you know that's how people are going to feel confident to start like pushing back on their stuff in their workplaces uh, you, you two are in contexts which have sort of far more migrant labor involved than, mm. than me is this something that people are concerned about or worried about i know you said before that brexit wasn't a big issue but are people worried about their status or, or kind of how things are going to change in the future the some of the meetings i had with riders in um in manchester like organizing these strikes it was like it was really eye-opening to see that like the the different what the way that like experience of borders experience of status like really affects how you live your life like they were the examples they gave of like oh it's uh it's this bit it's near the near the migrant office the place where they had to go to get that like i was like that's mm-hmm. that's near where my mate lives that's how i view that bit of town like i don't yeah, view yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah i mean other stuff like there was some comments on on brexit um specifically about whether you know the uh legal challenge that the IWGB was putting through about worker status would be able to be escalated to European courts but they were, like that was a very um minimal thing but yeah I mean the um it is notable how how different um people people's lives are when they are a first generation migrant and when they are one who has potentially like undocumented or some of their like close relatives are undocumented yeah. like one of the one of the things that did happen with delivery and it was something that they tried to like clamp down on was riders uh, lending their accounts to undocumented uh, relatives and friends mm. so people that didn't have right to work in this country could use the could use that app to make money and obviously like because of the that's in part allowed because of the um the nature of their self-employed status but also the way delivery could delivery could quite easily like combat that through the fact that they don't have a lot of workplace rights to defend themselves on that ground. Yeah. I mean, potentially a a no deal scenario creates a layer of incredibly precarious, undocumented migrant labourer, doesn't it? That, yeah. that that creates a different yeah. type of issue. I guess a similar issue, but a different type of issue where you get kind of areas of hyper exploitation based on people's constant fear that they're going to be taken to the border agency if they don't comply with really bad working conditions i I think they have the government has said that like citizens here can it would like generously said it can they can reapply (laughs) for uh, (laughs) for a country they've lived in for what 11 years now is it i think the consistent message across the entire episode has been that the trade union movement needs to step up yeah. yeah step up big time needs to step up for its members needs to step up on issues like brexit and needs to step up for those people who are in situations where it's difficult to stand up for themselves like yeah. the migrant laborers one way in which you can step up and help the work along <laughs> is donating to the new syndicalist project <laughs> via our patreon shameless you can visit at patreon.com slash new syndicalist there are a number of people uh, who have generously donated to our project over the past month and we'd like to thank them personally so that is Stephen, Don Frederick Olufsen, Joe Bertemieu and Kawaii Punk I hope I said all those correctly I tried my best one of the benefits of Brexit is that the pound is comparatively lower against the dollar <laughs> so your Patreon dollar subscriptions go all the more further <laughs> project. Is that is that you, Andy, coming out as a strong Eve stance on the past at behalf yeah, of New uh, on the yeah. basis that it, it accelerates our Patreon yeah. subscriptions? Yeah, Fuck that's that's else. my position. We've got more money to spend on our SoundCloud premium account. Yes. We're fine. <laughs> so yes, um, we do appreciate your support and helping the work along. Yeah. If you can give as little as uh, one. Dollar, I believe, is the subscription rate. So that's probably about one pound now. It might be ninety k <laughs> a month. It does help, and it helps us sustain the project. Yeah. This has been talking shop. Our long episode. This will be this the longest is... one we've done. 
Yeah, and I, we, I think we would agree that we would promise not to do too many that are this long. But, you know, hopefully it was fine. It's kind of one of those things, isn't it, where you've been bottling something up for a long time. Yeah. And you just need to splurge. You need to splurge yeah. all at once. To be fair, we have made a better job of this than the British government has made of Brexit. <laughs> so. I agree. So we'll probably revisit this issue in the future. We'd be interested in any commentary that you have. Please, we, we really do enjoy the comments that people put on social media, on the website. So please continue doing that. And if you want to contribute anything to the blog or be involved in one of our podcasts, then please contact us at newsyndicalist at gmail.com. You've been listening to Talking Shop. Uh, this is bye from Chris. And Lydia. And Andy. See you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Talking Shop, a podcast by New Syndicalist for trade union activists and organisers. If you'd like to listen to previous episodes or review our other content, please check out our website, newsyndicalist.org. You can also keep updated on future episodes by subscribing to our podcast via Acast, iTunes or Stitcher. While you're there, why not leave us a review to help us find more people like yourself? If you have a suggestion for future content, would like to submit your own ideas or would like to discuss any of the ideas raised in this or previous episodes, please contact us at newsyndicalist at gmail.com. Thanks again. Bye.